to not record to the cloud, record to my computer. All right. That way, that you know, that we'll be on uh, Facebook or not Facebook. We'll be on YouTube eventually. I just got to take this afterwards and uh, edit it and put it up and everything so you can watch back after uh, and everything that I have on the channel up to this lesson. And basically, this is the last lesson where we deal with the uh, designations of druids. We've already gone through the druid and the bard, and now we're in uh, part two of the seer's path. And tonight's lesson is uh, the seer's path into the past and into the future. And in the last class, uh, which is up on the channel, I talked about, I, I just basically talked about what the uh, seer's role was in uh, Celtic society, uh, specifically in Ireland and things that in, in those times. And it was actually pretty important. And what this, basically this class is gonna do tonight is we're gonna talk about what those things were a little bit more in depth and then how to put them into practice. Because one thing is Druids will tell you a lot of stuff about things, but then after that, it's like they don't tell you how to work with it. And I mean, there are a few that try, especially people that have, that's just all they do is they want to make sure people know, like Ian Corrigan and a couple other writers, but others, they just put the stuff out there and they go, here you go. And this is what you get. And then it's up to you to figure out, but that's kind of a good thing too, because that's how you grow in, in spirit because of the fact that, you know, you're the one that's figuring it out. You're not going to let a book, you let a book kind of guide you in directions but what happens with what you're learning and seeing in the world, that's up to you. So that's the one thing about the seer's path, which makes it so important, is the fact in uh, the last class, I believe that other than the fact that the Druid cast itself was very important to keeping the tribes going, and I also attest that the bards are basically the uh, ancient version of the newspaper. They were the ones that would come and tell the tribes what was going on. Uh, newspaper, evening news, whatever, talking about the deeds of the clans and things like that. So the bards were important. But I think for me, the most important was the seers because seers, they fulfilled many roles. Um, they were healers. They were visionaries. Uh, they were uh, advisors to the, you know, the clans and stuff like that because of the fact that they were the ones that were going through the rituals to you know to look into the future to look into the past and see what things are going to happen to them and their people what's going to happen to the land what's going to happen to the high king you look at so many of the ancient stories you know there are a lot of things that are tied to seership and a lot of people are afraid of it because they go oh well i have to be so proficient at all of these psychic things well that's the thing about it whenever you're working with psychic abilities in any guys, whether it's in Druidry or any other spiritual path, it's like lifting weights. You work with it, you gain muscle, you gain ability. And, you know, being afraid of it, it's like, try it. You know, if, if you're not able to do it for a certain amount of time, move on to something else. Give your mind and your body the ability to soak, soak it up. Because that's what we are. We're a battery. We take in the energy. We learn what to do with it, and then we put it out to whatever we need to put it out to. And one of the main things that are kind of tied in with the seer side of things is if you've ever heard of the, uh, the uh, Irish grandmothers talking about having the site, the second site, which we're going to talk about that a little bit more in depth here in a minute. But that was, you know, that's something that has endured in, in Irish and Celtic culture period from the beginning to now because there are still daughters and grandmothers and sons and all these things and you know wherever it is on the island that still believe that people have the second sight and the second sight is basically uh, it's 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 a magical version of not just women's intuition but earthly intuition that to such a degree that Whenever it happens to you, whenever you're going through the process of something that you consider being part of the second site, that is, those kind of things happen to you for a reason. 
a lot of people are scared of it because they don't under well of course you're going to be scared of things that you don't understand but those practices were things that the seers cultivated they didn't just want to you know just hope that they would be able to see things they did rituals they did incantations they did different things uh fire scrying and all these different things other rituals which we'll talk about a couple of them um is that that's what they wanted they wanted those muscles to grow so that they could be of use to the people and in the general sense too you know with the idea of uh they were herbalists they were healers so you would definitely want to take care of those within your your tribe and within your community because if you lose those people then it's very hard to take care of the the sick mothers the sick children and the old and infirm and things like that you know the the village will come together as it needs to but the seers were the ones that had the that little extra knowledge to keep everything together they were they were like the lynch i believe they were the linchpin in most of celtic society and uh the things that they learned through uh i mean there's so many what i'm going to do is after this whenever i put the video together for youtube there's good god there's at least 20 different books and stories that can be found either online or through the internet sacred text archive and stuff that give you stories about uh you know what the seer saw in various things uh you know various celtic uh manuscripts yeah that's the word i couldn't think of what it was various manuscripts that talk about the you know the things that were done one thing that the uh the seers were very important in is whenever a person was getting ready to die they would come to the person's uh home and sit with them and speak into their ear so that as they were dying they would guide their spirits into Tirnanok, the other world so they were very important you know during your end of lifetime not just you know being born and taking care of the mothers and stuff but in every aspect of life within society from babies to death and even after that they were very important and Speaking of some of the rituals, and we're going to get into some of the practices here. I have a very large notebook here in front of me that has a lot of notes and ritual writings and things. So, but one of the as a prime example of something that would be considered a uh, uh, a divinatory ritual is uh, a rite called the tarb face. Now, my pronunciations and my spellings may be wrong. But those that have studied a little bit will understand the tarb face is t-a-r-b-h-f-e-i-s and basically this particular ritual for those that were wanting to uh see into the see into the other world just see into the realms that were not a part of this plane what they would do is they would take this person is just you know uh somebody that was a little higher up in, in the knowledge arena of seers and another person would take the candidate out into the woods and they would be wrapped up in a bullskin. And as they were wrapped up in a bullskin where they couldn't see, um, a fire would be lit and they would drum. And while they were doing that, as they're laying inside, they're gnawing on a piece of raw meat. And that's where we get the saying, chewing the fat, believe it or not. And what would happen is with the drumming and the fire in the background and being rolled up, it would induce altered states. And in those altered states, visions and, and visions and, and other things and, and knowledges would come. So that's a visionary thing. Seers are visionaries. And also certain times there would be other situations where people within the uh oh like the greater the you know the 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 greater knowledge of the of the tribe would want to learn things so they would go to them and use them as like sages you know kind of like a dictionary if they didn't know it the ones that knew stuff were usually the seers because they were the ones that were getting out into the uh 
the you know the world and finding the herbs and finding the stones and finding the trees and reading the omens that's another thing is that's where we learn as druids to read the omens is the seers so whenever we go outside and we look at weather patterns we look at the flight patterns of uh birds um even the ogum themselves which uh we have the writing but there are estimated to be that you know that are readable right now or knowable they say there's hundreds but the ones that they've actually kind of put out to the public the rest of them you're going to have to look for but there's like 27 different kinds there's an ogum of your fingers there's an ogum of your nose there's an ogum based on birds um and it just goes on and on and i think a lot of those elements of knowledge uh even for us today have came up through the uh sears and now i can get into my notes that i've got here Let me make sure nobody else is wanting in all right this make sure okay all right some of these are divided into uh different uh practices and different things that are done within seership one of the first things is called asling a-i-s-l-i-n-g just so you can have a spelling of it and magically and and stuff within the idea of being a seer for the seers Aisling is a dream or vision normally from the sky. So if I'm thinking it's from the sky, then it would, for me, it would mean it's coming from the gods because, of course, we have land, sea, and sky. Um, Aisling may refer to altered states of consciousness. That's one of the things that we're always going through. That's what psychic abilities are, is us not in this, in this discussion, in this world. We're someplace else. We're in a place where it's the gods that bring us there or other forces of nature or other times or other existences. That's the one thing that I, I think is also very important to realize is that the seers were the ones that were making connections to many, not just this dimension, but other dimensions too. And uh, for thousands of years, I mean, the one thing that kind of makes me, you know, there's pagans on one side that are all this is, is archetypes, and things like that and yeah there's there are instances where that's basically what we're looking at but i think because of the fact that where we are on this planet in the universe um anything's possible because in reality we shouldn't be here there should be nothing but there's something and we're here so anything that you know they poo poo us about it's like as it can't happen they got to prove it to me because that's one of the things like I've told in various uh, videos on my channel that the reason why I am pagan and have been for so long is because I've been told that it's in a book and that's what it's supposed to be. And then you step outside and you see things whole different. It's not what, you know, the monotheists were saying. And I kind of came into the realization way back in 1993 that being pagan is a little bit more realistic it just is you know i'm not hello pam forbes welcome um it's like you know there's more meaning to this that's why i've been a druid now for since 1999 and how that came about was i just basically came into the realization that for me um you know, the dualistic thing between a god and goddess within Wicca and other, uh, you know, witchcraft traditions, for me, didn't cut it because you're looking at just two, two people, the, the male and the female, which, okay, I get that. But then again, I look at society, and I look at the world, and we're families, okay? So there's two there. Where's everybody else? Where's the aunts, the uncles, the sons, the daughters? And that's where I started to look into uh celtic pantheons various practices things like that and then eventually in 2000 i joined the order of stand or not well i am the founder of the order standing okay here but i joined the hanja keltria and i was a member with them for 
several years. I ran a study group and uh, at one time almost had a grove, but they were having some issues with, uh, I don't know if it was licensing or something within the major organization. So I ended up going out of that. But it's like, so these things, whenever we practice them, for some, it may be archetypes, that's on them. I don't know what their thought process is. But for me, if it's something that I'm working with in my mind, my spirit and everything like that, ritually and just daily, then why can't I give it the possibility of reality for us? You know, pagans, we say magic is, you know, magic is whatever. And we put these things out there, but how many of us actually believe it? How many of us actually seen things that don't, that don't jive, that don't, you know, send off all the bells and whistles because of the fact that, you know, we don't, some people don't know what magic is whenever they experience it. Others do. That's the second sight. Whenever you have these things that come up and uh, there's been men that have been afforded the second sight. Um, there's a lot of women in Ireland and around the world, and it's got different names. There's so many different names for second sight. I don't even want to try to uh, go through them, but it's something, I think that it's a, an ability that it's a communication. Okay. You're seeing these things and there's, they're there for a reason. Um, spirit is trying to contact you. The ancestors could be trying to contact you. Uh, for what reason? That depends on what you saw and how you interpret it. That's another thing. Everybody's magic is theirs. Mine is going to be different from Sean's or Pam's or Lacey's or anybody else in any other uh, pagan group that I know because we're all different. We're all individuals uh, you know, in the scheme of things, even in the realms of the gods. So, and that's the other thing is like within Druidry, the things that I like that are one of the things that just keep me locked in is the ideas of Imbus on the Irish side and Awen and the uh, Welsh side in that it's that inspiration, the poetic side of it, the things it's, it seems like, you know, uh, even though there's a lot of people that are attracted to Druidry and Azuchu and things like that, because they're a very, you know, warrior-esque type of, of situation, because the Celts and the Vikings were people you didn't want to mess with. But on the other side of it, there is a romantic side to it as well, in, in the literal sense. And so, you know, it's like people that, uh, you know, I think those that really go for it, and study and actually put things in practice, um, they're going to they're going to go far. And especially those that are interested in seership, because of the fact that there's so much to it. And that's one thing I'll say in every class that I ever teach or put out. I'm just giving you things that I know. You can say yes. You can say no. You can think whatever. But I'm wanting to hopefully give you guys ideas and things to think about and look through and stuff like that to add to your practice. I never want to detract from anybody's stuff. I don't want to, you know, you know, make their experience uh, spiritually as a Druid or whatever that they uh, work with, you know, as something that is uh, a detriment to them. So the, uh, the Imbus and Awen are very important, otherwise known as inspiration, poetic frenzy, the fire in the head, the Amergen speaks of and found also and other bardic tales. And then we have the practices of Ektra, which is translated, it basically roughly translates to adventure, expeditions and journeys that are uh, to uh, sacred sites. These type of magical happenings uh, usually were transportations, almost like a, a, a spiritual teleportation, uh, accidentally or by chance to uh, 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 learn something, but these lessons were mostly afforded to heroes that were well known, warriors that were well known, and those that were acclaimed hunters in Celtic, you know, ancient Celtic society. And then we have, of course, Dreyak, which is D R A, and my pronunciation, my Irish Gaelic stinks, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. Um, but it's magic translated. It basically means what druids do. 
and it is the uh, uh, Gaelic for Druid, Druidry and Druidism to a degree, loosely translated. And then we have the idea of seers as those who can bring out almost like lie detectors. And to a degree, there were things that the seers could do to basically tell if you were lying, if you were honorable, if you were honest, and there were things that they could do that would tell the otherwise if you were dishonest. Um, and it was called Fren, F-I-R-I-N-N-E, -N -N -E, truth or justice, the binding of forces of nature or the ways of nature that allow the seekers to determine, uh, what's this? Okay, my writing stinks sometimes, to determine the outcome of a question. So in other words, if you're wanting to know if your neighbor has been stealing your eggs, you can go to the seer and you know, maybe there's things that they can do to help you find out if your neighbor is, you know, been coming over and stealing. And that's, you know, that's the other thing is that uh, magic kind of worked. It, magic worked in the society to where it wasn't looked down upon. Like, uh, you know, there are like within the monotheistic churches and things like that. They don't know. They don't think that they're doing magic whenever they pray to their God or do anything that is a ritual as type of practice, they are putting that forth, but they won't say that. They'll say, well, if you say I'm doing magic, then I'll tell you that, um, you know, this is from a bad God or a devil or whatever. And we've come to learn over the years, you know, as pagans, druids and whatever, that as we practice, um, We become more uh, believable, especially whenever you have things that are things that have happened to you, members of your groves, groups, families, and stuff that you can't. There's lots of things that we cannot uh, uh, know the answers for and say that, you know, this is what this is. So whenever we do magic that we've actually seen something come from it, whether it's an earth ritual or whatever within a druidic context and stuff, it's like, Whenever you can like test it and show it for what it is, then people tend to believe you a little bit and it removes the skeptics. So I get so many people that say, whenever I say I work with a Druid group and stuff, they go, where's your pointy hat? Because they think that the Druids wore the pointy hats. We had certain types of hats, but I don't know if you, have you ever seen anybody that was a Druid with a pointy hat, Sean? I have not either, but... Yeah. I've seen that these people have said druids are supposed to have pointy hats. They've told me this. I'm going, well, if you want me to have a pointy hat, I'll tell you my hat size, but I don't have one. All right, we move on to the next. And this is, and these are things that are specialized. They're, you know, that's another thing. What I want to do for seers that people that are interested in the seership. One thing, if you can afford it, I highly recommend, regardless of your tradition, to try to see if you can acquire the Bardic course, the Druid course, or the Ovates course through Obod. They are kind of expensive, but I've known people that have really been objective about how they are from person to person to person. And if you can afford it, I, uh, you know, that I think there's a course through AODA and some other things out there that are available that kind of break it down Bardic, Druid, and stuff like that. And that's another thing is seers were gainers of knowledge, so they would not be afraid to seek out, you know, whatever information they needed. That's why we had the god Ogma, which my pronunciation was, but he was the god of libraries, books, knowledge. And that's one thing, you know, people say, why are Druids so knowledge hungry? Why not? You know, we don't know where we came from. We're working with bits and pieces. That's why we're called neo-pagans, you know, because we're not living in that time period. We're in this modern realm right now. So it's like, this is what we do. Everybody's way of practicing is different. But if you really put us all in a room and let us go in a circle and do the things that we do, there's a lot that is uh, connected that is almost the same. And I think that's cool because we learn from each other. That's why I do the classes. 
That's why I've watched some of the stuff that Sean's involved in and, you know, various things throughout the net. And I've, you know, back in the day, I used to do a, a radio program and I did interviews with Kasur Seraph of ADF, but that man is just a, a font of knowledge for Indo anything Indo-European. And then Ellen Everett Hotman, which is a lot of seer in her. If you get a chance to check out any of her druid or, druidic herbals and things like that, definitely get them, especially if you can get them on sale. Um, the next aspect that we're going to look at here is called Brioche, B-R-I-O-C-H-T. And this is a practice of the seers called a spell, largely and fully verbally, uh, verbal um, components. This spell or charm usually consisted of two lines or six lines, and these lines with eight syllables preceding those with four syllables. So it's kind of like a verbal druidic haiku with just weird differences in the way that you speak and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's a creative, I think that's a creative way of working. And this next one, I'm not even going to try to uh, pronounce it completely. It's called Le Page Lanlaiti, which is L-E-A-P-A-I-T-H. Then the next word is L-A-N-L-A-I-D-H-I. Literally, harborage of complete attentions, which is basically guaranteeing that you have a secure mindset. To do Briox or meditations that are part of Briox, the place for performing these was called the Leobade. This was the bed or sleeping place of the poet or seeker who was searching for Imbus. This place would be warded physically and spiritually. This is where we get the term lying in the stream bed of, of inspiration. There's a book called Lying in the Stream Bed of Inspiration. Another author that speaks about this is Tom Cowan's Fire in the Head. Uh, Fire in the Head is a separate thing, but it does go with lying in the stream bed of inspiration, um, which if that's another thing, if you can find that book, I highly recommend that you get it too. Hold on just a second. I've got to get a drink here. Another thing that I think is very important that uh, and anybody can do it, and I think the more that you do it, you're going to get better. One thing that made Sears very, hello, um, one thing that made Sears very uh, proficient is what they did because they were never afraid to, before they did a ritual or something for another thing, they were not afraid to do divination. So if you you know, read the ogum, if you do tea, if you do palmistry, or any of these other things for other people and yourself and these things, I recommend that if you can do some kind of divination, whether it's for yourself or others, at least two times a week, you know, whether it's, a, you know, somebody's asking you a question, or you have a question, anything that allows you to look into uh, the other realms and stuff, whether it's in, whether it's in, part of your spiritual practice or just doing it individually to something that you would do by yourself and away from others or even if you've got people that you work with doing that with them too because there are group form group forms of divination but i recommend that you do as much divination as you can because the more you do the better you get and that's one of the things i mean i like doing herbalism i like doing ritual i like leading ritual but sometimes it's good to just Go into your temple, go into your space, set up a table, get you a candle and maybe a cauldron. We're going to talk about the cauldron here in a minute and its uh, uh, usages for various things. Um, but I have done some of the most incredible things as far as working for myself with just the simplest things away from people. Sometimes you don't need to have all of the noise and the just all that stuff that just closes in on you and you go into your space and you work. And I've had a lot of people go, well, I'm afraid to even meditate. Can you be quiet for 60 seconds? Not speak. You can think you can do anything you want, but if you can be quiet and not say anything for 60 seconds, you've started to meditate. You add more time. And then as you do it, one thing for me, it's not that 
stuff that they show with the gurus and stuff. One thing that you can do that's just as simple as it is, is not just not speaking, but try to clear thoughts of I got to pay the bills, I got to go pick up the kids, I got to mow the yard, just kind of knock those things out. And the more that you can just knock out, other things will come in. The gods will send things. Uh, the natural world, the ancestors, the spirits of place, the, the animal spirits around your, your home and things like that. When you're allowing more space into you, you're giving them more access. Uh, kind of like the idea with, with witches having you know, their spirit guides and things like that. I mean, there are, there are guides and things that I believe that come from the Celtic Druidic world as well, the ancestors. And whenever they come in and they want to talk to you, it's good. Let them in. Talk to them, even, with it, even if it's just with your mind. Because the one thing I think is, that's another thing. As Druids, our role is to not just take care of the earth, but as ourselves before we pass to our next incarnation, is to make those connections with the ancestors that come to us. Because those are going to be the ones that are going to get us into the other world. Those are going to be the ones that are going to set us up for whenever we do uh, come through our next, uh, you know, reincarnation. And so it's like uh, anything, uh, you know, there are people that are afraid to practice that they don't want to. Please don't be afraid. Try it. If it doesn't work, then you drop that for a minute and you move on to something else. Within the same vein, like a few, I'm one of those people that I've studied everything. I've studied the Druidic side, the Bardic side, which I love writing poetry. I've got in the back bedroom, I've got reams of it like that. But I, sometimes I just get a little bit too often in the clouds and I have to come back to reality. So, but that's one thing, you know, when, if you can do all of those things, you know, uh, you know, there are people that are geared to just working with all three. Um, and somebody said, well, I, how can you be all three? Well, if you're in an order, yeah, of course, eventually they're going to make you, you know, uh, choose your way and see what's going on. But as a solitary person in your own home with your own tools, you can practice any part of Druidry yourself. You don't have to be hemmed in, but also that's a good thing because then you get to follow your interests. And for me, uh, herbs, I can't grow anything just yet because I live in an apartment complex where the ground kind of sucks. So I have to wait just a little bit longer before I can put anything out. But you can just about bet I'm going to put some herbs out. I'm going to be drying some herbs and I'm going to have a lot of stuff for ritual. So that's the next thing. So don't be afraid to do divinations. And the next part, we've got something called Sulacht, which is S-U-L-A-C-H-T. And this is divided into parts. It's a feeling of being magically influenced, not necessarily by Brioc, which was the, uh, 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 the, the spells that were done with the different syllables and different amount of lines, but it says uh, it is a spontaneous magical insight, a state of being uh, is called face locked tied to sailing or reading the signs of the stars. Uh, seers tend to, we were the ones that knew what the constellations were. We were the ones that kind of set up how the Celts would whenever, whenever they would go out fishing knew how to read the stars so they could get back to the coast and get through the safe parts and be safe whenever they came in. The Celts were amazing people. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, you know, you have your Romans and you have your Vikings, but the Irish Celts and things like that, we were just five stars all the way up. The next portion of this is we have, uh, we, you know, I talked about reading the signs. There's signs of reading that we read in nature. In the natural world. And one of these is called Neolado Dirac. I'm not even going to try to spell it. Um, and this is a divination of the clouds. This is an omen cast from the clouds. Um, furtively spying. It's using the clouds to look on, to use to detect the actions and movements of an enemy or someone who has done you wrong in the past. Uh, somebody that you might have had trouble with at school or at a job or whatever. Um, and it is basically uh, focusing on those that even may be uh, wishing to cause you harm or uh, to an individual or a clan, possibly tied to uh, 
an astrological chart, an ast a, a Celtic astrological uh, working. And then we have the uh, next uh, phase of this. Uh, and uh, it's one of the things that I've been working on here for the last, I don't know, probably about four months. It's called diketal, which is D-I-A-C-H-E-A-D-A-L incantation. This is a way of achieving imbus by understanding each part of a given situation separately so that its combined meaning may be better understood. This is uh, techno technology or a early form of technology as it also gives insight to hidden agendas and its uh, root causes of those uh, agendas. Diketal dochene, which my pronunciation is horrible, which is do chi C H E N N A I B H. The incantations, that particular incantation is done with the fingers. Um, then we have uh, Houdinicht, which is H U I D E A C H T, which that's terrible pronunciation. This is like a time travel, traveling through life or death, one's lifetime, applied to journeys that go beyond boundaries, which is this earth, which is this world, which could be means going into uh, uh, beyond the veil, piercing the veil of the reality of this earth realm, which could mean going to the realms of the sky with the gods, or going into even beyond the earth with the uh, uh, Tiernan Oak and the other world. In my tradition, we don't necessarily work with Tiernan Oak in that way. Ours is, uh, you've heard the, uh, the phrase uh, beyond the, the uh, aisle beyond the ninth wave. Okay, well, the, the, there's Avalon. That's what that is, the Apple Isle. And then for us, it's called High H-Y Breesail, B-R-E-A-S-A-L. And that is the Irish connotation of uh, basically what uh, Avalon is. But with this, it's more um, in the realm and control of Mananon. And that says traveling through life or death applied to journeys that go beyond boundaries and into the earth realm. And then we have the ways that people go through this. And this is called Tramheel, T-R-A-M-N-H-E-A-L, L. Trance in which visions occur, usually induced by an herb. So if you ever see a shaman or a seer going over a fire and they've dropped some herbs into it and those noxious fumes, uh, to put it in the other way, it's like thinking of the uh, Oracle of Delphi sitting over the crack in the earth and letting the fumes come up. And then you were able to come up and get divinations and questions and miracles and things from the Oracle. Basically, that's what those fumes did. This is kind of the same thing in a Druidic context. Um, and then we have, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, what's for some druids that know it was called the heron pose. It's where the, uh, let's give you the best example. Um, Ian Anderson from Jeff Tull, when he plays the flute, he stands on one leg. That's the heron pose. And it is a form of crane magic, which this is Coriquinoct. My Irish God, I need to learn more. But this is crane magic. Brioche, but also Malakti. Brioche is more beneficial to you but Malakti is curses. Um, and somebody says that, you know, well, the Celts didn't curse. Actually, we were, we were the people that kind of went against the idea of, in, in modern Wiccan practice, you have the idea and harm and do what thou will. Druids and things like that, because of our warlike nature and the way that we didn't take crap off of anybody, we didn't fall into that vein of, you know, uh, live and let live. And that's where you get the curses in the Malakti. And even in war, there would be two druids, one on one hill, one on the other, and we would be taunting each other magically. Those are called satires. And eventually what that would do is the one that had the better satire would be the group that won the battle. And so their druid was better. So it kind of gave you bragging rights. And um, uh, that idea there was... Uh, I don't know if it was if it was the Dogda that was pictured, but Dogda is basically has been pictured as having one leg and his 
his uh, uh, club that he would drag. His club was what made all of the boundaries of Ireland. And it was also that with his uh, uh, cauldron, which is very important in all this, always have a cauldron handy to use in your workings. Um, the cauldron was what would bring men back to life. Uh, and by the crane magic, but it was a malactic curse by standing on one foot with one eye closed, one hand in your belt. This magic is associated with edges, boundaries, and uh, dividing lines between realms. And then we have Kumat, which I'm still probably not uh, pronouncing that right. But this in, in, in a seer's uh, mode is basically seeking for power, authority, and influence. The term is also used to describe the effect that a mighty one uh, with great power would have otherwise uh, 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 answered uh, a question for them. Uh, this was also the effect of Ogham uh, consonants that come up, there was power that came from the Ogham consonants whenever you would try to speak them, um, which one of the Druid chants, if you ever heard I-O, well, there's one that goes E-I-O-U. And it's, it's, it's specialized, it takes a lot of practice, but there's a way that you go E-I-O-U. And it's hard because we speak it this way and it sounds the way that that sounded. But there's a way where it just basically blends, almost like the Gregorian chants that we've all heard, you know. But it just becomes such a thing. And when you're doing it, oh boy, the energy that you feel coming from the gods, stuff, that's one thing. But you kind of become a conduit to things. There's feelings. There's deals that are going to come up into your, your consciousness that you haven't experienced before. And, you know... Um, that's one thing, you know, that's one of the things about paganism is a lot of people are afraid to find their power. They just hobble along and do these little things and they stay, you know, kind of basically off to the background. That's fine. That's great. I, I love people that are just wanting to get out there and worship the gods and do whatever. But those ones that have taken the time to go the extra different distance, whenever they find their power, A, they know it. B, other people if they're, you know, mindful, we'll see it. And once they really get it going, it's hard to stop it. Unless life and situations come along, then, you know, everybody has just as much of a chance of, you know, having, you know, things not go so well. But that's why we practice magic, because we want our lives better. We want our lives of our family and our people, you know, our people to be better. So, you know, that's one of the good things about practicing something like Kumak, because, then it at least gives us a sense of identity and who we are. Um, uh, also, there's, there was methods for this that were the linking of beginning a word with one sound and then linking it to another. And the word would be modified in its endings and then changed again. The meanings often of the words themselves would change over time. From this, the basis of similarity uh, uh, comes the power of sounds, names, and incantations. So the other thing is uh, the idea of like, if you're out in the woods and you find a fairy or you found a goblin or whatever, one of the things that we've come to know magically, there's power in a name. If you know the name of the nature spirit, then you more than likely can have sway over it if need be, because there are those those uh, malevolent beings that we don't necessarily want to mess with, but it's good to know have the idea that to know the name of something is to have its power. We have power over it. So if there's ever something that you have to deal with and you know what it is, then uh, you know you have a better chance. If you have the name of what it is, you have a better chance of dealing with it. Uh, I've had a lot of people over lately that have been wanting me to come bless their house because COVID has drove everybody nuts. But when you're driving everybody nuts because they're scared and things like that, people do inadvertently bring things into their homes. It's negative energy for themselves. 
their kids, their poor little kids are scared all the time and stuff like that. So parents get stressed from keeping their kids in, you know, in a level space. So that's another thing that I think some of the Sears practices that you can do daily, just a little meditation, um, just daily, just a little meditation to buck yourself up. Because as soon as you get done with that, you got your day to deal with. You got work, you've got all these different things. And then at the end of the day, when I get ready for bed, I've got a candle and a little altar uh, table by my bed and I light it for just a few minutes. I sit there, I calm myself down. I thank the guys for another day. And then I have a snuffer that uh, I let it get down to just a certain amount. And all of those gratitude candles, I'll take them and I've got a box and eventually I've got a little candle maker and I repurpose them. I never bury candles. I mean, you can, but my thing is like, why do I want to bury that energy? I know you want to give back to the earth, but there's other ways that I give back to the earth. But those things, I think because it's my energy and it's for a good purpose. Um, and I am recycling. So, you know, that's just one way of doing it. Now we have uh, the one thing that everybody's always going to, well, we do all this stuff for these nice things, but what about protecting ourselves? Okay, and we have something here called Miltonach, M-I-L-L-T-E-A-N-A-C-H-T. -E um, basically, this is a type of uh, practice that Sears would use that would be uh, effective uh, against magical attacks, a term often used in place of destructive uh, powers, uh, perversions, or spoiling fits well with uh, uh, glam decomb, a power of great sat satire and attack magic. So basically, this is kind of one of the uh, offshoots of the satires that the Druids would cast back and forth on the fields of battle. This is something that's kind of attached to that. And let me see here. All right, cool, cool. And then we have the next uh, little bit here, which is called Gabler. Yeah, Blair deal, which is fort attention, division of consciousness. And that's where we get the idea of the site. We get the idea of ESP. We get the idea of clairvoyance, clairaudience, and things like that. Uh, uh, during uh, Sauvale, which is S A or S A M H A I L L, uh, the word relates to. Samalt, this uh, uh, double is provided with limited ability to continue certain magical actions. This is basically like having somebody like physically divert you. This is like having a construct kind of divert you. While your own attention is diverted to other actions or other worlds, um, also useful for interaction between worlds. In other words, whenever we've done uh, have any of you tried to do astral production? Yeah, that is, it's a skill. It's something you really have to work at. And this is kind of like an augmented version or form or something like that. Uh, we always think of the silver cord and all that. And if the cord gets cut, you're lost and all that. Well, this way, you don't have to worry about the silver cord because there's a construct that doesn't have it. I don't think there was anything in the Celtic lore or literature that I know of that says that we had any kind of, we do have the ideas of, you know, reincarnation, Anamkara and all that, but we didn't have that being connected thing. We had other ways. And this was one of the ways to kind of actually project with a purpose. Sometimes we just actually project and we don't know what we're doing, which is cool. You know, at least you're learning and you're experiencing what it is. Um, one of the most important ones that I, that I tell a lot of druids to look into uh, as they're finding themselves is in, in a seership way is called Imrama. It's I-M-M-A or I-M-M-R-A-M-A. -M -M -A. And basically it is a journey to where the gods uh, live uh, by shamanic flight, literally a sea or air journey towards the Western ocean which is where the islands of otherworldly paradises are located. So Imrama is something that takes you to Avalon, that takes you to the land beyond the ninth wave. And the one thing about that is you don't have, to, one thing about visiting the other world or Tiranog or in, even in this instance, 
We don't have to die to go there. Whenever we have communications with the ancestors and things like that, you know, it's like we're still here. So it's not like that we have to physically give up our life to go there to have those experiences and have those conversations. Imrama is a practice that allows you to do that while you're living. Um, and then we just have a couple more things and then we're almost done. Uh, we have, which is something here is called Gisa Dorich, which is about the worst pronunciation, but it is a seeristic sorcery, a type of divination concerning Gisa, or magical callings. Uh, 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 a Gisa is compelling you to do something to uh, like, uh, in, in, in a lot of the, the Britonic uh, stories, they were sent on a quest to do something. They were compelled to go do this for their king and for their, their masters and their lords and things like that. This is basically the Irish version of that. And it's associated with uh, the winds and the weather. Gisa are ge uh, geographical taboo, uh, interdictions, interest restrictions against doing a certain thing, although they may be given a task, duty, or great work to do, such as like the search for the Holy Grail, believing that the Grail sits at Glastonbury Tor, Chalice Well. That whole kind of vibe right there is something that is uh, considered a great work because it's always been thought within the Catholic Church that they would find the Holy Grail at the Tor. Well, they've explored the Tor and they haven't found it. But for us, we have, you know, even though we may not identify as Catholic, but there are Catholic Druids. I've actually met a couple. But the thing about that is, though, uh, we look at those places such as the Tor and Newgrange and, and other places like that. We look at them and see that, well, you might not find the thing that you're looking for in it because we know that the entire earth is interconnected and that everything has a reason and a purpose you know that's what the spheres are looking for what is the purpose how does the purpose fulfill what i have to do for my tribes for you know the people that i work with and how you know because eventually they may be called to go to their high king and tell them some things so it's like you know, understanding uh, these different practices of the sorceries and divinations for the, ge the geas, um, that was important too. And then we have something called Srath Bua, which is a current, uh, is like a concentrated flow of magical and spiritual power that is just one, is just one of many forces behind Dry Dryopt, Philodect, which is the uh, bardic versions of, of like song spells, song magic, poetry. A, druid, a druid's magic directs a stream to sustain a shield of invisibility or to perform a magical flight. Shrosbua is immediate and experiential. It is knowledge and experience. I kind of take that into the idea of deja vu, the light bulb going off over your head that's what I consider that to be. But also you're realizing that that light bulb going off over your head is a good thing. It's a power that is uh, kind of given to you uh, to, you know, to put to, to these other uses, as it said. And the last thing before we get ready to kind of round, round things up with this class is something called Rain Furich, which is a type of, of uh, beneficial Briox set before hand, which awaits. It's like something where you magic something and a desired effect is going to happen at a certain time. Uh, trigger. You know, if the, part A happens, then part B will happen after this. And that's what this is. Um, you know, they might set up boundaries and have things magical to happen to invaders of their territory. So this is where you go out and you set up the spiritual booby traps, you know, things that can deter, uh, you know, theft and, you know, warring bands that want to raid you and things like that. So, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. And I think within the reading list that I have, as far as just a couple of books that I'll give you right off the bat that are pretty decent to work with. One is the Celtic Seer Sourcebook 
and that is written by John Matthews. It's a big book. Uh, it can be found on Amazon, I believe, but there you'll just have to see, you know, what prices you are. Uh, maybe you can check your local uh, cult and pagan type bookstore and get them to order it for you, but that is a very good resource. The other book that uh, I recommend is the uh, uh, Celtic Encyclopedia, and I'll have to get the full uh, uh, name of that book, but it's one, it's about so thick, and it is by Caitlin and John Matthews. The other one that talks more about the seership side of things is another book by uh, John Matthews called uh, Elements of the Druid Tradition. Little book about so big, and I think it came out in the like late 80s, 89, 90, something like that. So I'm going to put that list of 20 different books that you folks can look through, and I'm going to see if there's any uh, druidic groups or anything that's done any work in seership and put those there as well. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this on uh, YouTube, and Sean's in enough of the druid groups that, that uh, uh, I'm part of that I'll put it up and other people can check up to it. And what we're going to do is I've been doing a lot of talking for most of these classes, but because it's getting to be spring and I've got a new camera that needs to be taken out of the box and put through its paces, what I'm going to do is we're going to start doing a series of classes where we get hands on. We're going to do everything, whether it's, you know, learning how to meditate, learning how to work with the spirits of the earth and things like that. We're going to go out and we're going to go to some different places and do that. Um, next class. Uh, I think just for the heck of it and because I want to, I'm going to do a live class where I pitch a batch of mead and show you guys how to do this. Because what I do is I take half of the mead for my enjoyment and the other half I actually use for ritual. And this batch... I've decided to be nice to myself and I got some elegant raspberry, uh, red raspberry liqueur type of, uh, uh, it's like a syrup or something that I can add to it and it's going to be beautiful. And I'm going to take you guys through the process of how to make it and we'll go through the time all the way up until I bottle it. And then what I might do is do a giveaway to those that are over 21, mind you. <laughs> Uh, of a bottle of it because it's just so beautiful that's another thing about being about pagan it's because we can make mead uh there's so many things irish cooking i don't know if you've ever had celtic cooking whether it's boxty or some of the sandwiches and things that they have over in ireland the food is just oh pagans we love two things a nice adult beverage and copious amounts of barbecue or of fire fire cooked foods drumming friendship that kind of thing so it's like yeah we're gonna be doing that and i might as well uh, before it gets too hot we might do a live cooking class because i want to do uh there's hot cross buns and things that you can have for ritual and i kind of want to show you guys how to make some of those and stuff but i appreciate everybody that has come in and i appreciate sean being here i see sean all over facebook and and to Lacey and Pam and anybody else that may have checked in, I want to thank you guys for coming in tonight. And what I'll do is when the next class comes up, I'll just go ahead and uh, put out information. And if you can't come, that's cool. But if you see it, share it with a friend and we'll get a bigger uh, group of people in here next time. I can have 100 viewers and uh, it would great be great to, you know, have as many people in here learning as I can. So I appreciate everybody, Lacey, Pam and, and Sean. You guys have a good night and i'm going to go ahead and stop recording have a great night folks <clears throat>